Hello and welcome to Down the Scope. Today we're going to be talking about the histology of the brain, specifically the cerebrum and we'll make another video on the cerebellum another day. This is a section of cerebrum from a calf and at low power we can make out some anatomic features. We have the gyri, which are these wrinkly bits on the brain, and then sulci, which are the depressions or the folds and we can just see them coming up into the gyrus and then a sulci there. Each of these wrinkles on the brain has an external capsule of grey matter and then a central core of white matter and you can almost make out that the grey matter looks very much more cellular. This is where all of the neurons are and then the white matter is much more pink and dense and this is where all of the axons are. If we start to look at things at a higher power, we can move from the outside towards the inside. Encasing the brain, there are the meninges. If you remember from your gross anatomy, there are three meninges, the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. The dura mater is often not present on slides because it's very much separate and comes away easily, whereas the arachnoid mater and the pia mater are much more firmly attached to the brain itself. The outermost layer of collagen and connective tissue is going to be the arachnoid mater. And then below that, there's a space called the subarachnoid space, which often has uh, blood vessels, some of them quite large. So all of these, there's a nice vein there and then adhered to the brain is the pia mater. You can barely make it out. All of this collagen here, just adhering to the gray matter underneath will be the pia mater. Perhaps over here, it's a little bit more convincing. So we have collagen of the arachnoid mater with all of these nuclei being fibrocytes. We have the subarachnoid space filled with blood vessels. And then there's just Another thin little bit of collagen here, you can just make out the wavy fibers with a fibrocyte there, for example. Now, moving into the parenchyma, it can be difficult to work out where the boundaries between cells are. In other organs, you tend to have clearly defined structures, epithelial cells and other distinct features, whereas in the brain, you're hit with a mass of pink and nuclei which leads some pathologists to refer to the brain as the great pink wasteland, a relative desert of histologic detail. But as we'll find out, most of the cells in the central nervous system have highly branched cytoplasm, extending processes out to interact with other cells and structures. Most of what you can see as a pink mess is actually a fine mesh of all of these processes, dendrites and axons too fine and intertwined for us to make out on standard stains. With the exception of neurons, all we can see is the cell nucleus. And all of this pink meshwork we refer to as the neuropil. In the grey matter, we can spot all the different cell types of the central nervous system, which can basically be split into two categories, neurons and glial cells. Neurons are the largest and most abundant cell in the gray matter. In schematics, the neuron has a large cell body or soma, which extends numerous cytoplasmic processes called dendrites. There is a large process called the axon that travels to the axon terminals, where the neuron forms synapses with other neurons. In the cerebral cortex, which is what we're looking at here, neurons are organized in layers or laminae. Sometimes you can make out maybe different subtypes of neurons forming a layer. So here there are these slightly larger neurons. If we just zoom in on them, these ones here. And if we follow them along, we keep on bumping into maybe more examples. So although it looks like a bit of a mess, most of these neurons are arranged in laminae or layers. Neurons have quite distinctive features and these three are quite good examples of those. They have large nuclei, which often have very dispersed chromatin and a prominent nucleolus. The cytoplasm is quite dark blue due to a large amount of RNA present. So all of this kind of smudgy blue stuff. 
this is called nissel substance and loss of the nissel substance can be a sign of early neuronal degeneration and appearance known as chromatolysis. Sometimes if the neuron is cut in the right section, you'll be able to see the axon extending away from the cell body. So here in this one, we have a cell body and you could just maybe make out here a large projection heading away from it. That probably is the axon. Let's have a little mooch around and see if we can find some other examples of that. This neuron here, we can see it has a very large nucleus, very prominent nucleolus, and this little substance, and then you can kind of just about make out that it's forming an axon going up this way, and here this one as well. Maybe you can just make out that there's a little projection coming out there. Neurons in other parts of the brain can look quite different. So this is one of the gray matter nuclei in the brainstem where the neurons are much larger. They have a lot more nissel substance, which is very prominent. And perhaps I can convince you more that they do have projections and axons. Like in this neuron, we can see the cell body and then kind of sending off this large process, which is probably the axon. And of course, there'll be lots of secondary processes as well, the dendrites heading out. So in this neuron, we can make out the cell nucleus, this nucleolus, and then it has three projections coming out from it. It'd be very difficult to tell which one is the axon. And I think, to be honest, it's probably quite impossible. And maybe in this area, you can be a little bit more convinced about what I was talking about as of the neuropil being uh, formed of all of these cytoplasmic projections from all of the cells around. So here, rather than just being a big pink mass, maybe you can make out lots of tiny lines that are making up the neuropil. And these are probably going to be all of the projections from these glial cells that we can see. You might even be able to convince yourself that this line here is maybe an axon. If we have a look at this neuron here. We have a big cell body and then coming away from it, we follow that line before it disappears. There's quite a large projection possibly coming from it. And this looks quite similar. It's a very subtle wavy line coming out. So maybe that's another axon. Back to the cerebrum and let's see in, if we can convince ourselves of some glial cells as well. The most common glial cell is the oligodendrocyte. In the gray matter, these tend to be around neurons. But they're much more numerous in the white matter because these cells are responsible for making the myelin that will encase the axons in the white matter. They're similar to Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system with a few differences. For example, Schwann cells myelinate a single axon, whereas oligodendrocytes can myelinate up to 50 axons each. This means that they have an incredible branched appearance, which as we've discussed, you won't be able to see on H and E stains. Oligodendrocyte nuclei are dark, very condensed and often surrounded by a perinuclear halo. So we can see a couple here. As we mentioned previously, they tend to be around neurons. This one, very likely to be an oligodendrocyte, has a very condensed nucleus. It's next to a neuron and it has the perinuclear halo. Same with this one here, this one here, and then there's another good example down here of an oligodendrocyte accompanying a neuron. The second type of glial cell that we'll talk about are astrocytes. You can't see much of the cytoplasm, but immunohistochemistry shows them as very large cells with many branches reaching out into the neuropil, giving them a star-like or stellate appearance, hence the name astrocyte. Astrocytes that are close to neurons will extend their processes to the non-synaptic regions of the neuron, and those close to blood vessels will wrap their processes around the capillary basement membrane and create the blood-brain barrier. Those close to the meninges will form a barrier against the basement membrane of the inner meningeal layer, the pia mater. This is known as the glia limitans. Essentially, the astrocytes will determine what enters or leaves the central nervous system, as well as maintaining a consistent intercellular environment for the delicate neurons. So they're a very important cell type 
in maintaining the homeostasis within the brain. In terms of spotting them on a histology, they can be quite challenging. Their nuclei tend to be slightly larger uh, and less condensed than the oligodendrocytes. So uh, something like this could be an astrocyte. And maybe there's a, a couple down here and there. This nucleus might be an astrocyte. And perhaps there's another one there just close to this blood vessel. I often think of them as having round nuclei, but sometimes they can appear more oval, like this one just here. The final glial cell type are microglia. When they're not activated, these cells have elongated dark nuclei. As with other glial cells, you won't be able to see their cytoplasm, but in reality, they have a similar branched appearance to the others, but with a little less volume. If the neural tissue is damaged, the microglia activate and transform into large phagocytic cells, acting like the macrophages of the central nervous system. They can be very difficult to find. Most of the elongated nuclei that you see are actually endothelial cells from capillaries. So for example, uh, this nucleus just here is likely to be uh, an endothelial cell from a capillary. You can always check to see if there are erythrocytes nearby to signal that you're actually looking at a blood vessel. And actually this one here is a pretty good example of an endothelial cell just wrapping around it and forming this capillary. Let me have a look around and see if I can find something that I would be more convinced of as a microglia. So maybe something like this has a much more condensed nucleus compared to the astrocytes that we looked at earlier and it's elongated and it's not near any blood vessels. So that would be a candidate for a microglia. Possibly this one here as well, although the chromatin is a little bit more dispersed. It's an elongated nucleus. It's not forming a, a blood vessel like this one here is. So that would be another candidate for a microglia. As we move from the gray matter, you can see all of the neurons sparking the gray matter. And then there's this kind of anatomic division with the white matter. There are suddenly no neurons and huge numbers of oligodendrocytes, these dark nuclei with a perinuclear halo. And we can still find some of the other glial cells. So that's a good example of probably an astrocyte with a slightly larger and more dispersed nucleus to the oligodendrocyte just next to it. These larger nuclei here, again, probably astrocytes. The white matter has this kind of bubbly appearance to it. Remember that it's just made up of myelinated axons. So sometimes we'll get an axon cut in transverse section. Here's a nice one. That's a nice pink axon with a clear myelin sheath around it. The distinction between white matter and gray matter is quite easy to see in the cerebrum, but as we get towards the midbrain and then the brain stem, to me it becomes a little bit more indistinct. So for example, this is a section of midbrain. This is a, a colliculus, one of the knobbly bits just below the cerebellum. Then we have the midbrain aqueduct here. And around that we can see some lightly staining gray matter. And then there's all of these white matter tracts and some of them are quite large and obvious, but for example, down here, the division between white matter and gray matter is not as nice as it is in the cerebrum. We've kind of got these circular white matter tracts where we can see the nice pink axons. And then just next to it, we've got another kind of area of gray matter with these neurons. So the distinction between white matter and gray matter in the brain isn't always as nice as it is in the cerebrum. Now there is one more area of the brain that's worth talking about, which is the ventricular system. Now, this is an interconnected series of chambers and channels within the brain that's filled with cerebral spinal fluid, more commonly referred to as CSF. Here in this section of cerebrum, we can see an example of the lateral ventricle just between the cerebrum and the hippocampus. 
if we zoom in on this, we can see that it's filled with all of this proteinaceous material, which is the CSF. The ventricle itself is lined by cuboidal epithelial cells. These are ependymal cells. Most epithelial cells will sit on a basement membrane, but ependymal cells are an exception to this. Instead, the base of the cells, the ependymal cells, is finely branched, and these branches interdigitate with processes from underlying astrocytes. So there's no defined basement membrane as you might see elsewhere. Also within the ventricles, there are branching fronds of fibrovascular tissue lined by epithelial cells. This structure is called the choroid plexus, and this is where CSF is produced. The epithelial cells will actively transport sodium ions into the ventricles, and then water will follow by osmosis. Almost all other molecules are prevented from entering the CSF by the blood CSF barrier, which is formed by microscopic tight junctions between the choroid epithelial cells, which we would need an electron microscope to be able to see. As in other areas where absorption and secretion is important, these cells have microvilli, and you can just about make out a little fuzzy border that represents those microvilli just there. So that ends our exploration of brain histology for the moment. Uh, as I mentioned, there's still one part of the brain left to discuss, which is the cerebellum, but that has such a distinct layered structure that it's worth a video in its own right. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments or suggestions for topics that you'd like covered in the future. Thanks for watching and until next time, goodbye.